all as well. So anyway, uh, thank you to uh, Garth and Kevin for getting us set up on that. I do want to let you know for tomorrow that we will uh, we'll, we'll still have a couple of things going tomorrow. Actually, three different things that are going uh, tomorrow morning. We have uh, done a, a message that Brother Sam preached that will be going at 1030. So be sure to tune in at the regular time online for that. And then in the evening, Lord willing, we'll be uh, running the video of this evening service here. But then also there is a, a ladies um prayer over zoom and so uh, lots of good stuff that will be happening tomorrow tomorrow is pentecost sunday and so that's a special day we're believing that god is going to pour out his spirit in a mighty way we know that god is not limited that god is uh god doesn't have to be stuck in any location but he is able to work and move freely and we're believing for that so we're going to start off with prayer here tonight so join with me in your vehicle there. Let's reach out to the Lord. Let's ask God to come and to have his way here. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we worship you right now and we exalt your name. Uh, God, we praise you and we lift you up, Lord. We welcome you, God, to come and to speak to our hearts here tonight, that you would come and have your way. God, our hearts are hungry for you, Lord. We're looking for you, for your presence and your power, Lord. Uh, and so, God, we welcome you, Lord, into this service uh, and we exalt you and give you praise together, O Lord. Lord, in Jesus name. Amen. Well, the team is going to come. We're going to sing. Sing with us. You got to be loud enough that right through your windshield. I want to see your windshields pulsing. You're singing so loud there tonight. Amen. God bless you. Well, I believe tonight the Lord is getting ready. Whatever your mountain is tonight, your mountain may be COVID, but it may be something else seems like the world has literally gone crazy but I know a God who reigns and he is here and the Lord is getting ready to move your mountain
worship you, Lord oh God, Jesus. Lord. We stand I on your promises, Lord Jesus. I thank you, God, for your promises, Lord Jesus. We worship and exalt you, Some glad morning. Where are we going to go? We're going to fly away.
worship you tonight, God. God, you are worthy of the praise, Lord Lord Jesus. Jesus. We praise you, you, oh God. Amen. You feeling good? Brother Haynes is feeling pretty good. He's got a loud amen going there, so that's that's great. Amen. Well, uh, I, it is great to have a little bit of onboard sound up here tonight. We bought some cables this week, and so we're a little more prepared for this. You know, it's kind of ironic. We're in the middle of getting ready to build a new church building and working towards that, and we can't even use the one that we have. And so it's a weird uh, state of affairs right now. And on that note, I do want to encourage you that if being in church matters to you, you do have an outlet through um, our local government to reach out to them, reach out to their office and say, I want to be in church. And I believe that if there is no one that says that they're missing church to them, they're not going to be all that motivated to get us back into church. But I do believe that we do have a, a right that is given to us by the Charter of Rights and Freedom to assemble together. Amen. And so I, I believe that it's, it's important for us to to push for our rights. We want to do it responsibly. We want to do it right. We want to keep you all safe. But we do believe very strongly that the Bible commands us to assemble ourselves together. And so uh, on that note, I'm not here to get political tonight, but I do believe that it's important for us. If we never raise our voice and we never speak out, then who will? And so it is important for us to, to recognize the day in which we live and the importance of what we are doing. So you're ready for the Word of God here tonight. All right. By the time we uh, we get back in church, I'm going to know, instead of knowing you by your amen, I'm going to know you by the sound of your toot out there because all of you have a distinct uh, horn sound. So anyway, you, you have your own voice. That's good. Good, good. We're going to look at Mark chapter 13 and verse 32 here tonight. And I'm going to be talking to you about the signs of the times here tonight. Mark chapter 13 and verse 32 says, But of that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch, and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch, therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning, lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. There's an exclamation point there at the end. Jesus is saying we need to be watching. And so tonight I want to share to you from God's Word that it is later now than it has ever been. I want you to join with me in praying right now. Let's call upon the name of the Lord and let's ask that God would speak into our hearts and lives right now. I believe that God has a word from the Lord for you. And so open your heart to receive it. Lord Jesus, we come to you right now and we are asking God for your hand of anointing and help, Lord, uh, to be upon your word. God, I pray, Lord, for each one, every individual, Lord, that's here right now for the service. Uh, God, those that will later join us via the internet, God, I pray, Lord, over for each one that your word would speak into their lives, God, and that you would help us to recognize uh, the hour in which we live and to respond to it in the right way, God, uh, not with fear, not with doubt, God, but Lord, with the certainty, Lord, that now is the time for us to watch and be ready. We thank you for your word in Jesus name. Amen. I do want to take a moment before I jump into preaching to once again thank all of our ministry team and that has been helping out with our daily devotion. Give them a honk if you appreciate those daily devotions. We have heard some great words from the Lord and I am so appreciative of all that they do in working to help with that. As Sister Abbott alluded to a little while ago, we're living in a day of great uncertainty. 
And uh, there are, of course, people here tonight of all kinds of different ages. And so some of you have seen a little bit more than what others have. But I don't believe that any of us have seen an hour quite like this particular moment. We're on top of uh, COVID and all the related aspects of that. We are in a time when there is looting and rioting and great unrest in people's lives. Uh, I uh, recognize that uh, I've read recently that in some places uh, there are actually doctors are attesting that they are seeing more people whose lives are being lost to suicide right now than what is to COVID. There is a great uncertainty in our world, in our atmosphere, in our culture right now. But you know what, even before all of this most recent stuff, there was all kinds of doomsday events out there. Maybe a few years back, you remember that the Mayan calendar was running out, so the end of the world was nigh. And then there was talk about blood moons, and uh, then there was rumors earlier on. It just seems like a long time ago, but just a little bit while ago, we were talking about war with Iran and war with North Korea and all of those things things because it always seems like something is going on unfortunately the media thrives on creating this culture of panic it uh, it sells used to sell newspapers now it sells clicks and uh, it when people are in a frenzy over something it makes them easier to manipulate just like the you know the when you get into a mob type scene people will do things that they would not do on an individual level and so when people are in a state of panic a state of fear they are easier to manipulate but here's the problem fear might be an effective short-term motivator but it's a terrible long-term motivator I don't know how many of you either as children or who have had children maybe at their school but they have walked through a haunted house and uh, when they go through that haunted house the first time uh, they are scared to death all the things that pop out of them and freak them out. And uh, maybe they're even scared the second time or a little bit the third time. But if they go through it eight, nine, ten times, they are no longer afraid. They're starting to see, you know, the, the cracks where things are, aren't quite realistic. And so they're laughing. They know the timing of when something's going to pop out of them. And they are no longer afraid. Some of you also, to give a different kind of illustration, like myself, I don't regularly do roofing. We've got a few roofers in the church, but I don't regularly do that. And so when I'm working on a roof, doing shingles or some kind of work up there, for the first little while that I'm up there, I am very aware that I'm up at a height where I could get hurt. And there is some fear. I'm careful in the way that I move. But after you've worked in that environment for a while, you stop being afraid. And in some cases, you actually become a little too cavalier and not as cautious as you should be. You or people that you know were probably very scared by COVID for the first few weeks. But after all COVID all the time for three months, it's clear that many people are ready to get out of their houses and accept the risk. And sometimes because they have been cooped up for so long and they're sick of being afraid, they will even take unnecessary risk because you can't be afraid forever. And it's for this reason that I've never been a fan of trying to scare people into salvation. Hellfire and brimstone kind of preaching, it might scare someone the first few times, but there will come a day when people are no longer afraid. Because I say again that fear is a poor long-term motivator. As a student of prophecy, I've never taken the approach of trying to shoehorn current events into prophecy and to make predictions about the end or the last days. Uh, I've been on a few conference calls over the last few weeks, people asking me, because I've you know written some on prophecy and they're kind of known as a prophecy guy, and they wanna, they're asking me, saying, Pastor Abbott, what does all this mean? How does all of this fit? into prophecy and while I may talk about generalities and principles and how the framework of scripture we can see things starting to come into play I've never been comfortable with trying to say that this means that or I've never been one to try to predict the return of the Lord or tell you who the Antichrist is and there's a reason for that because every doomsday prediction that never materializes every prediction of the Lord's return through current events or Jewish festivals or secret calendars when that date comes and then it goes it just lulls people to sleep and makes them complacent give me a beep if you have ever heard of Edgar C. Wisenant before 
That's what I thought. All right, give me a beep if you've ever heard of a book somewhere roughly around the title, 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 88. I thought you might have heard of that one a little bit more. That's Edgar C. Wisenant that wrote that. He was actually a NASA engineer along with being a Bible student. And he wrote a book right before 1988, as you may have figured out, called 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will Be in 1988. It sold 4.5 million copies, and it stirred a lot of people up with its prediction of a rapture event in 1988 based upon the Jewish festival of Rosh Hashanah, which was kind of the basis of his research. But of course, 1988 came and went without any rapture. Well, Mr. Wisenut was um, persistent, and so in 1989, he wrote a second book called The Final Shout, Rapture Report 1989, and he predicted, you guessed it, that the rapture would come in 1989. Well, that book did not sell 4.5 million copies. But undeterred, he came back in 1993, predicting a rapture in 1993. And then in 1994, he wrote another book, but you couldn't hardly, uh, he couldn't pay you to buy it at that point. The ironic thing is that while he was wrong every time, you could argue that every book was closer to being true than what was the last one. But the problem is, is that while people were willing to buy in in 1988, when that prediction came and went, they were less likely to buy in in 1989 and even less likely in 2003 and 2004 because fear is a poor long-term motivator. But here is a greater problem. Every doomsday predictor that is wrong chips away at people's expectation that the Lord's return is going to happen at all a little bit further. I believe that we can get a sense of the impending season of the Lord's return. I believe that we can probably all feel that something is starting to accelerate around our world right now. There are things that are changing. But there is a very important reason why we don't know the day or the hour of the Lord's return. It's this little thing we call human nature. See, there's a good percentage of the population, maybe including you, that struggles with something called procrastination. If you're guilty, give me a beep. See, a few of you were even late to honk your horn. See? See, there's a good percentage of the population that struggles with that. In fact, studies of students show that between 80 and 95 percent of students are guilty of procrastination at the university level. And while those levels aren't as extreme among adults, studies show that the percentage of procrastinators is in fact growing. You see, if we know when our deadlines are, we will often put off doing what needs to be done until the last minute. And we'll have this big flurry of activity and productivity will cram as it's called. And of course, that's what a lot of university students, the night before a big exam, they'll be staying up late and perhaps all night cramming and getting ready, doing stuff that they probably should have been do doing uh, for days and weeks leading up to that moment. And I believe that that is the very reason why no man knows the day or the hour. You see, what would happen if you knew that Jesus was not coming in your lifetime? Would you be as motivated to live right or to witness or to work as hard for the kingdom of God? You see, I'm afraid that the answer would be no for many people. And so Jesus said this, as we read in our text, Mark 13, 32. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Take heed, watch and pray, for you do not know when the time is. It is like a man going to a far country who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to each his work and commanded the doorkeeper to watch. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, or in the morning lest coming suddenly he find you sleeping. And what I say to you, I say to all, watch. You see, every generation beginning with the apostles believed that their generation would be the one to see the return of Jesus to this earth. In fact, the, uh, the common expression greeting among the early church was Maranatha, 
which spoke to the return of the Lord. When they greeted one another, it was with an expectation, Jesus is coming soon. They lived and worked with urgency because Jesus was coming soon. And that was by God's design, that they had that motivation to know that their generation could have been the one in which Jesus returned. And I believe that that has been true of every generation, because no one knows the day or the hour. I come from a long line of preachers, and my great-great-grandfather thought that it would be his generation that saw the return of the Lord. Likewise for my great-grandfather, and my grandfather, and on down to myself, and I believe that my children believe with all their hearts that the Lord will return in their lifetimes. And that's the way that we're supposed to feel. We are to live with expectation of His return. So I'm not here to give you some kind of prediction of the Lord's return, nor am I trying to scare you. But what I'm here to tell you tonight is that it is later now than what it's ever been. My title comes from the story of a, a little girl who, uh, like many little girls, didn't really want to go to bed at the time that her parents wanted her to go to bed. And so they, uh, they tried to put her down, and they were in the living room. They were reading, and she, would, uh, she had gone to bed, but she popped up after 10, 15 minutes and said that she needed to go to the bathroom. So they let her go to the bathroom and then sent her back to bed. And then another 10 minutes later, she was up, and she needed a drink. And, you know, and it was one excuse after another. And finally, they had to get very stern with her, and they said, if you get out of bed again, there is going to be consequences. And so she laid there trying to squeeze her eyes front shut like a good little girl and, you know, and to try to focus on going to sleep. And, of course, you all know that the harder you try to think about going to sleep, the harder it is. And so she laid there. And in their house, there was a grandfather clock. And you could hear it, you know, ticking, the mechanism going back and forth. And then, of course, on the hour, it would toll out the time. And so just about the time that the clock was to strike... 11 p.m. There was something that failed in the mechanism. And so instead of stopping at 11 tolls, it went on to 12, and then 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. And by the time it hit 18, the little girl could handle it no longer. Uh, she jumped out of bed and she ran downstairs yelling at her parents, uh, it's later than it's ever been. She had never heard it hit 18 o'clock before. Well, I believe that right now we are seeing the clock hitting 14, 15, 16, 17. And it should cause us to wake up and realize it's later now than it's ever been. The signs of the times are all around us. But what should we take from this? I'm not saying this to cause fear. There's been way too much fear in our society over the past few months. But what I am here is to inspire a sense of focus and urgency with, within your heart. Because one of the big problems, the warning signs to me right now, is that with all that's going on in our culture, our culture is not responding the right way to the warning signs around us. <clears throat> How many news articles have you seen about the importance of God in the middle of this crisis? Probably none. How many articles have you seen or segments of news that are focused on concern over people's eternal souls? Probably none. How many have you seen about the importance of church and having a chance to seek God and to get right with Him? Also, probably none. You see, in this time of great urgency, in this time when our world has been turned upside down, people should be crying out to God. They should be repenting. They should be turning from their wicked ways. But are they? Studies show that people instead are binge-watching shows on streaming services. The studies say, say that people are averaging eight hours a day of watching content on things like Netflix. Alcohol sales are up. Around 25% in online alcohol companies like wine clubs are up 300 to with 300% in some companies up to as high as 600% in others. <coughs> Marijuana sales are up 80 to 100% here in Canada, and some pot shops are up as high as 500%. 
Likewise, pornography sites have seen a spike in traffic during the lockdown. And so what we see, rather than people turning away to God, we see more and more people that are trying to run from the problem, trying to medicate the problem, rather than trying to fix the problem of what's going on in their soul. Instead of the news fix on, fixating on what really matters right now, we instead see it's all about death tolls and criticizing leaders and spinning worst case scenarios and giving us the latest report from the experts that contradicted their report from last week. Or maybe now we're going into the phase where it's about people who are shaming others who don't conform to the new COVID morality. I don't believe that God sent this pandemic, but I do know this. This has been a prime time for people to consider their souls and their need for salvation. You're all familiar with the story of the Old Testament prophet Jonah, whom God sent to Nineveh to give them a warning because of their wickedness. And the warning by Jonah, it wasn't a very eloquent warning, wasn't even a very nice warning. But the people of Nineveh, they took it to heart. And from the king down to each and every one of them, they went into a time of collective prayer, fasting and repentance. They called out to God and God in mercy averted his wrath and they were spared. But this pandemic has resulted in many just having more time to stream their favorite shows. Maybe open another bottle of wine because they don't know any better. They're trying to deal with stuff. They're trying to deal with their fears and their anxieties by distracting themselves. They want to laugh a little bit. They want a little bit of entertainment. They want to be able to put their mind on something lighthearted. They're medicating their pain with alcohol and with drugs. But church, it is later now than it has ever been. But what that means for us is that this is our hour. Jesus said in Matthew 24 and 12, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold, but he who endures to the end shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to all the nations, and then the end will come. For us, our warning sign doesn't need to be about pandemics uh, or about riots uh, or about other kinds of crises. Our focus needs to be uh, on the gospel being preached to the world uh, as a witness. Uh, Jesus says, and then the end will come. Uh, and so as we see the signs of the times, it's not time for you and I uh, to retreat like a turtle into our shells, uh, trying to hide away from the world, uh, scared of what's going on around us, uh, but rather this this is our time uh, to be bold and to proclaim the gospel, uh, to recognize that time is short uh, and this world, our culture, uh, our community needs a church uh, that is bold and unafraid, uh, a, a church that has answers in the midst uh, of this crisis. It is time for us to wake up to the urgency of the hour and shake off the complacency that settles onto our shoulders so easily. You see, we cannot change how our media or our politicians or even our culture has acted to this point. But we can make a difference by showing a better way, by highlighting what really matters. We have but a brief window left, I believe, to reach the lost and to bring them to the Lord. Jesus said this in John 9 and 4, I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day, the night is coming when no one can work. You see, Jesus recognized that there needed to be an urgency to his actions because his time was short. And my brothers and sisters, I believe the same is true for us. We need to recognize that we have got a narrow window in which to work. For the night is coming when no one can work. You see, the spirit of our culture, it tells us to take our ease. The back seat of uh, my car over there, there is a car magazine. And uh, I subscribe to a car magazine. I, I like looking at cars that I can't afford for some crazy reason. But there in the last few uh, car magazines that have come, there are full page ads that have been taken out from the CDC telling people to 
not go out, to not associate with others, but saying do, uh, binge watch. And my wife and I were appalled when we saw that. Where in the world has it become a good thing by any measure to binge watch and to, to just spend your life in frivolity? It's not something that any real study would ever support, and I'm shocked that the CDC had even pushed such a thing. But the spirit of our culture says this is time for you to just ease back, relax, buy into the values and entertainment of our culture. You see, Satan wants to lull the church to sleep right at the key moment when we need to be the most alert. But I want to tell you here this evening that you are not laid off from the work of the kingdom right now. This is not our hour where God has said it's time for you to uh, to uh, be furloughed for a while from the work of the kingdom. Uh, I want you to forget about the lost and I want you to forget about souls and I want you to forget about seeking my face. Uh, no, rather this is the moment where God is shaking us uh, with urgency saying, church, uh, wake up. Uh, it's not time for vacation. It's time to seize the day. Uh, it's time to work while it is day. For the night is coming when no one can work. This is our hour, church. So in conclusion, let me issue a call for the church to awaken and recognize that it's later now than it has ever been. It is time for us to awaken to the need of this hour. Romans 13 and 11 says, And do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. For our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. So let me send a call to the church here tonight. Your community needs a church that is awake, a church that is bold, a church that is focused, a church that is not caught up in fear or distraction, but recognizes that we have been given a golden opportunity, a, a moment that God has given us to help to bring about the revival of the end. And so I want to challenge you right there in your car uh, to cry out to God right now. Uh, I want to challenge you if you're watching in your home uh, that you cry out to God right now uh, and say, God, I don't want to fall asleep in this moment, uh, but wake me up, oh God. Uh, wake me up to the needs of my family, uh, to the needs of my neighbor, uh, to the needs of my community, oh God. Uh, they need the gospel, uh, and you have called me to share that gospel with them help us oh god reach out to god right now oh lord we need you in this hour we need you right now oh god help us oh lord jesus speak into our hearts i pray oh god thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you jesus thank you Thank you, Jesus.
literally freezing cold. <laughs> but uh, next week, hopefully, we can greet you. But thank you all for coming. <laughs>